Hello and welcome back to my forestry lecture series. This is the second video and it will be focusing on leaves. As always, here is my contact info in case you have any questions or comments. So I made up this gimmick where I would structure my videos in the same manner as how you would paint a wall. The first part of the video will be the primer coat, which will introduce basic relevant info so that we're not jumping straight into the complicated stuff. It gets you ready for the main coat sort of like a primer coat of paint does. And just like a coat of paint, it looks best if you let each coat dry, which is why I suggest waiting a little after each coat of the video before continuing. This lets you digest the content and make sure you understand it fully. During this time, if you are confused about something, you can perform your own research to try to understand better before moving on. The main coat will be the bulk of the video and it will go into detail about several areas of the topic of the video. And the final coat is the clear coat, which will just be a short recap of all the things we went over during the video to make sure the information in the main coat and primer is protected or preserved for a longer period of time, just like a clear coat of paint would do. Remember from the previous video, we talked about the importance of etymology. Knowing certain prefixes and suffixes can help you figure out the meanings of words you haven't seen before. We talked about the main parts of a tree, the roots, trunk, and leaves, and each of their purposes. And finally, we talked about the importance of taxonomy and how it helps us classify different species of trees. What is a leaf? A leaf is an organ capable of performing photosynthesis. Remember that photosynthesis is a process that converts carbon dioxide and water into glucose and oxygen using energy from the sun. Most of the water is taken in by the roots and transported up to the leaves, and the carbon dioxide is taken in by the leaves themselves. When both the water and carbon dioxide are in a leaf, and the sun is shining on that leaf to provide energy, then the leaf can perform photosynthesis. Now we can begin talking about the internal anatomy of leaves. A leaf is typically divided into three main regions, the epidermis, mesophyll, and vascular bundle or veins, and is structured sort of like a sandwich, as you can see in this picture. If you'll notice, the vascular bundle layer does not stretch across the entirety of the leaf like the epidermis and mesophyll layers do. In fact, the vascular bundle resembles more of a straw-like shape which can be seen more clearly when the cross-section is rotated like it is in the image. Keep in mind that this is the view from the side of the leaf, so this sandwich is less than a millimeter thick. Lastly, when describing angiosperm leaves, the upper and lower surfaces of the leaf are called the adaxial and abaxial sides respectively. One way I like to remember this is by looking at the one letter that differs between these two words, the D and B. If you remember to rotate these letters 90 degrees clockwise, then the bumps correspond to the side that the term describes. Stomata, or singular stoma, are the pores or openings in the epidermis of leaves and other plant organs that regulate the rate of gas exchange between the inside and outside of a leaf. Gases that pass through the stomata include oxygen, carbon dioxide, and water vapor. Water vapor in particular is involved in transpiration which is the process of water leaving the plant in the form of water vapor. Like humans, plants have different types of tissue. There are three main types of tissue that can be found in a plant. Dermal tissue, ground tissue, and vascular tissue. The dermal tissue functions to protect the plant and prevent the loss of water. The ground tissue is the main bulk of a plant, and its functions are to provide storage and support as well as to convert food into energy, in other words, the plant's metabolism. And lastly, vascular tissue serves to transport various nutrients and fluids around the plant. Now we'll compare the terms deciduous and evergreen. Deciduous comes from the Latin word decadere, meaning to fall down, which is what the leaves of a deciduous tree do every autumn. If a tree is deciduous, its leaves will change colors and eventually fall off in autumn and regrow in spring. If a tree is evergreen, leaves are present on the tree all year. This is not to say that evergreen trees keep the same leaves forever, however, as evergreen trees do shed leaves. 
The difference is that the leaves of evergreens are continuously being grown and shed, and not all at once, which makes evergreen trees appear as green throughout the year like the name suggests. Evergreen tree leaves have special adaptations, such as a needle-like shape or a thicker waxy coating which allows them to remain on during the winter. Now we'll compare the terms broadleaf and needle. As discussed in the previous lecture, the trees of the Science Olympiad forestry list can be divided into angiosperms and gymnosperms. The leaves of angiosperms are typically broad and flat, hence why they are sometimes called broad leaves. On the other hand, gymnosperm leaves are typically stiffer and needle-like. There are other types of gymnosperm leaves besides needles, but for now, the two main categories of leaves we will focus on are broad leaves and needles. Most broad leaves are deciduous, and it becomes clearer when you think about conditions during the winter. There is less moisture in the air, the temperature is lower, and snow is falling. Rather than use up more resources to keep the leaves alive in these harmful conditions, trees simply shed their leaves until the weather becomes favorable again. Additionally, the broader leaves tend to accumulate large amounts of snow, which could weigh down branches and potentially cause breakage, harming the tree. Trees with needles are typically evergreen for the opposite reasons. The needle-like leaves have a smaller surface area, so less snow will accumulate, and they are more resilient to the harsh weather present during winter. One more thing is that angiosperms can be further divided into monocots and dicots, which will be covered more in later videos. Leaves can be simple or compound, depending on whether or not the leaf is divided into smaller leaflets. Other morphological characteristics can describe the organization of the leaflets in compound leaves and how leaves are attached to a branch, also called phyllotaxy. Leaves can also be described by the edge, shape of the tip, surface texture, the pattern the veins form, and the size of the leaf. All of these characteristics describe the morphology, or physical form at a non-microscopic scale, of a leaf. Being able to recognize the patterns and structures of the overall leaves and leaflets is a key skill to aid you when identifying tree species. Now we'll move on to the main coat of this video. Here's the chemical equation for photosynthesis. Notice that the equation is balanced, which means that there is the same amount of each type of atom on each side of the arrow. The light energy necessary for photosynthesis to take place is captured inside cells in an organelle called a chloroplast. Inside chloroplasts is a pigment called chlorophyll, which is responsible for capturing the light energy from the sun. Chlorophyll is green, so it is responsible for the green color of leaves for the majority of their lifespan. When leaves begin to change color, they stop producing chlorophyll, which slowly reveals the true colors of the leaves as yellows, oranges, and reds. It also follows that a leaf's capability to perform photosynthesis decreases as it loses its green color, since it is losing the pigment that captures the energy for photosynthesis to take place. There are three main types of photosynthesis, C3, C4, and CAM, and they differ around how they deal with the process of photorespiration. Almost all trees and all species on the national forestry list use C3 photosynthesis, with the exception of the saguaro cactus, which uses CAM photosynthesis. I will leave a link in the description to more resources about the differences between the types of photosynthesis if you are interested. So here we have our leaf sandwich again. Let's start building this image from scratch, starting with the mesophyll. It is important to note that we will be modeling the structure of a dicot leaf, which if you remember is a type of angiosperm leaf. Later on, I will cover the internal differences between a monocot and dicot leaf. The word mesophyll can be broken down into meso, meaning middle, and phyll, meaning leaf, combining to form middle leaf. This is fitting since the mesophyll is the layer of cells in the middle of the leaf. The mesophyll can be divided into two parts, the palisade mesophyll and the spongy mesophyll. These parts can also be called the palisade parenchyma and the spongy parenchyma, since the tissue that makes up the mesophyll is called parenchyma, a type of ground tissue. Parenchyma that contain chloroplasts can sometimes be called chlorenchyma, 
and since the mesophyll parenchyma contains chloroplasts, it can be called chlorenchyma. The palisade mesophyll has larger, cylindrically shaped cells that contain the majority of the chloroplasts in the leaf, and as such, perform the majority of the photosynthesis. It is always located above the spongy mesophyll. There can be one to three layers of palisade mesophyll cells, and this depends on the level of sunlight a leaf is exposed to. Higher levels of sunlight mean that a leaf will have more layers of these cells in order to take advantage of all of the energy from the sun it is exposed to. Leaves in the shade will likely only have one layer of palisade mesophyll cells because it isn't exposed to enough sunlight to justify adding more photosynthetic capabilities. This difference in layers explains why leaves in the shade will typically be thinner than leaves exposed to direct sunlight because the leaves in shade have less layers of cells. If we look at the palisade mesophyll cells themselves, we can see that they cycle the chloroplasts around, letting the ones at the bottom regenerate while the ones at the top are exposed to the most sunlight. The spongy mesophyll is made of smaller, irregularly shaped cells that are more loosely arranged than the palisade cells, leaving more intercellular air spaces between them than the palisade cells. The spongy mesophyll cells are still capable of performing photosynthesis, but are much less likely to than the palisade cells. Since sunlight comes from above and the palisade mesophyll is located above the spongy mesophyll, most of the sunlight is absorbed in the palisade mesophyll, leaving only the small amount of light energy that managed to sneak through the palisade mesophyll to be used for photosynthesis by the spongy mesophyll. As such, the main purpose of the spongy mesophyll is not to perform photosynthesis. Instead, its main purpose is to allow the movement and exchange of gases using its large intercellular air spaces. The gases being exchanged are oxygen, carbon dioxide, and water vapor. Next, we can add a vascular bundle to our cross section. Vascular bundles are also called the veins of the leaf and are sometimes visible to the naked eye. The veins have two purposes, transporting materials and acting as a rigid structural support for the leaf. There are two types of vascular tissue in vascular bundles, xylem and phloem. These two vascular tissues are surrounded by a particularly thick-walled parenchyma called the bundle sheath, which adds protection and rigidity to the vascular bundle. There are different types of vascular bundles which have different arrangements of vascular tissue, but the type of all vascular bundles in leaves is called collateral closed. I will go over all the types of vascular bundles, as well as more in-depth info about vascular tissue in future videos. Part of the reason I chose to do leaves first is because they serve as a nice introduction to vascular tissue. The primary purpose of xylem is to transport water into the leaf, but it also transports nutrients that are dissolved in the water. If you think about where this water is coming from, the roots, then it makes sense that the water only ever flows upwards since all of it is coming from the very bottom of the tree. This water is then used for photosynthesis and transpiration, which will be covered shortly. At maturity, xylem cells are actually dead, but being dead does not prevent them from carrying out their purpose. In a vascular bundle inside a leaf, the xylem will typically be on the adaxial or upper side. The primary purpose of phloem is to transport the sugars produced by photosynthesis away from the leaf to all other parts of the plant to use as food. Since leaves are around the middle to top of the tree, the sugars it is transporting need to be able to go upwards and downwards to reach all parts of the tree. In a vascular bundle inside a leaf, the phloem will be on the abaxial or lower side. Next we can add the bread to our leaf sandwich, which is the epidermis. The word epidermis can be broken down into epi, meaning outer, and dermis, meaning skin, combining to make outer skin. It is present on both the adaxial and abaxial sides of the leaf. The purpose of the epidermis is to protect the plant from infection and water loss, as well as to regulate the gas exchange between the inside of the leaf and the outside world. The epidermis is a type of dermal tissue. It is usually a single cell thick and it is composed of a few different types of cells. The majority of the cells in the epidermis are called pavement cells, which help protect everything underneath the epidermis. You may also see these simply called epidermal cells. The epidermis is going to be peppered with microscopic holes called stomata, singular stoma. 
The purpose of stomata is to allow gas exchange between the inside and outside of a leaf, such as oxygen, carbon dioxide, and water vapor. There are several different types of stomata depending on the species of plant, which may be worth looking into on your own time. Because it is needed for photosynthesis, carbon dioxide moves into the leaf through the stomata and oxygen moves out of the leaf as a product of photosynthesis. However, when stomata are open to let in carbon dioxide, water in the leaf is able to evaporate out through the stomata in a process called transpiration. Transpiration is the loss of water in the form of water vapor, and about 97 to 99 percent of water absorbed by a plant is lost through the process of transpiration. Transpiration is important because as water is lost through the leaves, more water is pulled up by the roots because of something called the cohesion tension theory. I will leave a link in the description that explains this theory in more detail, but the details are not necessary to understand the contents of this lecture. When more water is pulled through the roots, more nutrients dissolved in that water are also being obtained by the plant, and transpiration continues to move water and nutrients around the plant. The cohesion tension theory also explains why xylem can transport water and nutrients throughout a plant while being dead tissue. Transpiration also helps by cooling the plant through evaporative cooling in the same way your sweat evaporating cools down your body temperature. The rate of transpiration is mainly controlled by the relative humidity of the air outside of the leaf. If the relative humidity is low, which can be caused by high winds or high temperatures, the rate of transpiration increases. In order to prevent too much transpiration from happening due to these conditions, or to stop intaking carbon dioxide during the night when no photosynthesis is occurring, stomata have the ability to close. Next to each stoma are a pair of specialized cells called guard cells, which control the size of the opening and how much gas can get through. Guard cells are crescent or kidney shaped and are the only type of cell in the epidermis that contain chloroplasts. The size of the stoma is controlled by guard cells expanding and contracting. They are able to expand by filling up with water, and any cell that is filled with water is said to be turgid. When guard cells are turgid, the stoma is open, and when guard cells contract by losing water and becoming flaccid, the stoma is closed. Subsidiary cells, also called accessory cells, will sometimes surround guard cells and are a type of specialized epidermal cell. They protect the rest of the epidermal cells from the expansion of the guard cells. Trichomes, also called leaf hairs or epidermal hairs, are epidermal outgrowths that appear as tiny hairs to the naked eye, giving leaves a fuzzy appearance. The purpose of trichomes is to protect the leaf against herbivores, UV rays, and other harmful things. Only some leaves have these, and they are typically surrounded by subsidiary cells as well. The last part of our leaf sandwich is the cuticle, a thin, waxy layer found on the surface of leaves that is impermeable to water. You can think of it as the crust to the bread on our leaf sandwich. Its main function is to prevent water loss through anywhere except the stomata, but it also protects the plant against physical and toxin damage. It is secreted by the cells in the epidermis and is made of two main waxy polymers, cutin and cutan. The adaxial surface of a leaf typically has a thicker cuticle since it is more exposed to the sun and therefore more at risk to water loss. Leaves at the top of the canopy that are exposed to the most sun, called sun leaves, will also have thicker cuticles than those growing lower and in the shade, called shade leaves, for the same reason. Plants in drier climates also tend to have thicker cuticles because retaining water is much more important when it is a scarcity. Another adaptation that plants in drier or hotter climates have to help retain water is having less stomata. This will reduce water loss because there are less openings for transpiration to take place. Next, we're going to talk about how the internal structure of a leaf differs based on the orientation of the leaf. The word dorsoventral can be split into dorso, meaning back, and ventral, meaning front, which just emphasizes that there are two different sides to this leaf. The leaf cross section we just finished making illustrates a dorsoventral leaf, because we were making a dicot leaf, and almost all dicot leaves are dorsoventral. All or almost all of the stomata present on these leaves are on the abaxial surface, and this is because these leaves are oriented perpendicular to the sunlight. 
Since the abaxial side of the leaf is not directly exposed to sunlight, it will typically be cooler and therefore less prone to losing too much water through transpiration. The term hypostomatus refers to having stomata only present on the abaxial surface of a leaf. The placement of stomata also helps explain why the spongy mesophyll is located under the palisade mesophyll, since the majority of the gas exchange will be occurring at the bottom of the leaf due to the most of the stomata being on the abaxial surface of the leaf. The other type of orientation is isobilateral, which is found in most monocots. The word isobilateral can be split into iso, meaning same, and bilateral, meaning having two sides. So together, the word means that the leaf is the same on both sides. This makes sense because the leaf is oriented parallel to the direction of the sunlight. So each side of the leaf will be equally exposed and neither side would be adapted to more or less sunlight. In isobilateral leaves, the number of stomata on the adaxial and abaxial surfaces of the leaf will be roughly equal. The term amphistomatus refers to having stomata present on both surfaces of a leaf. Also, since there is equal sunlight received on both sides of the leaf, there is no differentiation of the mesophyll, no palisade or spongy. It's all just mesophyll that performs gas exchange and photosynthesis. Now we will move into leaf morphology, or the structure and shape of leaves at a larger scale than what we were just doing. The majority of these terms deal only with angiosperm leaves. Here is a diagram of a leaf that we can go over pretty quickly just to get familiar with a leaf. The blade or lamina of the leaf is the big flat section. The apex is the tip of the blade, the margin is the edge of the blade, the veins are the vascular bundles that we talked about earlier that transport water, nutrients, and sugars. The midrib, or midvein, is a thick vein that runs down the center of the blade, and the base is the bottom of the blade. The petiole is the stalk that attaches the blade to the stem or twig, and the stipules are these little leaf-like structures attached to the base of the petiole. The petiole of a leaf can hold the leaf blade out and twist it so that the blade is exposed to the most sunlight possible, and so that the leaves above don't cast shade on it, which is called self-shading. If the leaf is self-shaded, its ability to perform photosynthesis will be reduced. Leaves that are long and narrow sometimes don't have a petiole, and instead the blade is attached directly to the stem. If we know that a purpose of a petiole is to prevent self-shading, we can guess that leaves without petioles don't have as big a problem with self-shading. This turns out to be true, because the long and narrow leaves that lack petioles don't cast a very big shadow, making self-shading less of a problem. Leaves with petioles are called petiolate, and leaves without petioles are called sessile. Petioles are also relevant in the topic of abscission, which is the process where trees drop their leaves away. The word abscission essentially means to cut away, which is what deciduous trees do to their leaves every fall. It would be wasteful for a tree to drop leaves with valuable nutrients still inside, so trees extract all of the nutrients it can from the pigments in the leaves before dropping them, particularly nitrogen. As the tree extracts nutrients from the pigments, these pigments begin to degrade and break down. The pigment chlorophyll, which is responsible for a leaf's green color, degrades faster than the red, orange, and yellow pigments in leaves, which slowly reveals those colors in leaves during autumn. This degradation of chlorophyll, combined with the tree not making any new chlorophyll as winter approaches, results in the change of color of leaves in the fall. After the tree is finished extracting nutrients from the leaf, it separates the leaves at a point called the abscission zone, which is a layer of leaves located at the base of the petiole that's designed to break off towards the end of autumn. Leaf venation describes the patterns of visible veins, or vascular bundles, on the blade of a leaf. It is important to note that there are many systems that have varying names for different venation patterns, so you may come across a variety of names in your own studying. I will go over the system that I think is the most common, in which there are two main venation patterns. Parallel, which is found in most monocots, and reticulate, which is found in most dicots. As you can see in this flowchart, each main type of venation can be divided into pinnate and palmate venations, also called unicostate and multicostate venations. 
and the palmate venation can also be divided into convergent and divergent. Parallel venation, as we said before, is found in most monocots. In this type of venation, the majority of the leaf blade is covered in veins that are arranged parallel to one another. In leaf A, we can see a pinnately parallel venation. The term pinnate simply means that a single midvein is present that runs from the base to the apex of the blade, and that there are smaller secondary veins that branch off of that midvein, much like the feather of a bird. As you can see, the veins that branch off of the midvein are parallel to one another. The term palmate means that instead of there being a single midvein, there are several thicker primary veins that originate from the base of the leaf blade. You can think of palmate leaves like the palm of your hand, with each of the larger primary veins being fingers. In leaf B, we see a convergent palmately parallel venation. Convergent means that all the primary veins come together or converge at the apex of the blade. In leaf C, we see a divergent palmately parallel venation which differs from leaf B in that the veins diverge all around the leaf blade and don't all end up at the same point. Although the image doesn't show it, leaves B and C have several thicker primary veins that make it palmate. Reticulate venation is found in most dicots. In this venation, the majority of the blade is going to be covered by intersecting veins that form a sort of net-like pattern. Some relevant terms are that an intersection of veins is called an anastomosis, and the verb to form an anastomosis is to anastomose. Also, the areas that are formed by veins bordering them are called areoles. You will notice that all of the leaves have a black and white area that illustrates the reticulate net-like pattern of the smaller veins that is present throughout the leaf blade. For leaf A, we can see that the overall structure of the larger veins follows a pinnate pattern, with one midvein that has secondary veins branching off of it. For leaves B and C, the structure of the larger veins follow a palmate pattern, with several larger veins originating at the base of the leaf blade. In leaf B, the larger veins diverge and end all over the leaf, making it divergent. But in leaf C, the larger veins converge or come together at the apex of the leaf, making it convergent. And again, in all three leaves, the black and white sections show the smaller veins that form a net-like pattern, making all three leaves reticulate. Like leaf venation, there are several different ways to go about naming laminar shapes, so I will go over a simple and common way to name them. When describing the overall shape of the lamina, it is important to first locate the axis of greatest length, which usually runs straight down the middle. Then go along this axis until you reach the zone of the lamina that has the greatest width. The position of this zone tells you the overall shape of the leaf. For example, if the greatest width is in the middle fifth of the leaf, it is elliptic. If it is in the bottom two-fifths of the leaf, or basal two-fifths, it is ovate. A simple trick to keep in mind is that by adding the prefix ob to some laminar shapes simply mean that you rotate the laminar shape 180 degrees. Consider the laminar shape ob ovate, which has the zone of greatest width in the top two-fifths, or apical two-fifths, of the leaf. Apart from the overall shape of the lamina, the shape of the bottom, or base, of the leaf can also be categorized, as well as the leaf top, or apex. Leaves exhibit what's called determinate growth, which means that once it reaches a certain size and shape, it stops growing. This is the reason why a tree that is hundreds of years old can have the same size leaves as a much younger tree. Leaf size is primarily dependent on genetics, so an appropriate way of classifying tree species can be by leaf size, since they will roughly be the same throughout a species. This method of growth contrasts with how stems and roots grow, which is called indeterminate growth, and means they will continue to grow as long as the tree has the necessary resources to sustain it. From small to large, the leaf sizes go leptophyll, nanophyll, microphyll, nodophyll, mesophyll, macrophyll, and megaphyll. The margin, or edge, of a leaf is an important identifying tool. There are tons of different margins in leaves, but there are a few common ones. A plain, smooth margin is simply called entire. Margins can also have teeth, and some common kinds of margins with teeth are dentate, serrate, and crenate. The side of the tooth that faces the apex of the blade is called the distal flank, 
and the side that faces the base is called the proximal flank. The dips between each tooth are also called sinuses. The leaf structure can be classified as either simple or compound. A simple leaf has an undivided blade, whereas a compound leaf's blade is divided into multiple leaflets. There are several different types of compound leaves, and in order to keep this video from being too long, I will leave the more obscure types to your research. An important property of compound leaves is whether or not a rachis is present. A rachis is simply an extension of the petiole. If a rachis is present, the leaf is pinnately compound, and if it is absent, the leaf is palmately compound. In both of these cases, all of the leaflets make up the blade of the leaf. If a leaf is pinnately compound, we know that means that the leaves are arranged along a rachis. We can further classify pinnate leaves by how they are arranged along the rachis. If there are pairs of leaves along the rachis with a leaflet at the end, or terminal leaflet, we say that the leaf is odd pinnate, also called imparapinnate. If there are pairs of leaves and the terminal leaflet is absent, we say that the leaf is even pinnate, or parapinnate. An easy way to remember this is to simply count the leaflets. As you can see, the presence of a terminal leaflet makes the total leaflets an odd number, hence it is called odd pinnate. Conversely, the total number of leaflets on an even pinnate leaf will always be an even number. These diagrams also illustrate the petiole rule, which is the stalk of each leaflet in a compound leaf. There is also such a thing as a twice pinnately compound, or bipinnate leaf, which is basically a pinnate leaf, but each leaflet is replaced with another pinnate leaf. There is a main rachis, and then branching off of that, there are smaller raculi, singular racula, and then attached to the raculi are the leaflets. Tripinnate leaves also exist, which are basically the same thing as bipinnate, but compounded one more time. There are smaller secondary raculi that are attached to the raculi, and then the leaflets are attached to the secondary raculi. In phyllotaxy, a node is a point on the stem where leaves, buds, or twigs originate. The area of the stem between two nodes is called an internode. There are three main types of leaf arrangements, and they differ based on the number of leaves per node. Alternate leaves have only one leaf per node, and they typically face in alternating directions. Opposite leaves have two leaves per node, and they are positioned across the stem from each other. World leaves have three or more leaves per node, and are all positioned around the stem in a circle. The majority of gymnosperm leaves are part of a subset of gymnosperms called conifers, which includes all trees that produce cones. Make sure you understand that the terms evergreen and conifer are not synonyms, as they describe different properties of a tree. They are often confused because most evergreen trees are conifers, but this is not always the case. On the National Forestry list, consider the tamarack, a deciduous conifer. The leaves of conifers can be either needle-like, awl-like, or scale-like. When differentiating between different species of trees with needles, it can be quite overwhelming at first if they all look the same. A key property to pay attention to is how the needles are attached to the twig. Spruce needles are attached to the twig by small woody projections called sterigmata, which remain after the needles are shed. Pine trees have needles attached to the twig in clusters called fascicles, and fir tree needles are attached directly to the twig in a suction cup-like manner. We have now finished the main coat of this video. If you're taking notes, pause the video and take a few minutes to try and write down the topics you remember from the main coat without looking at your notes. If you aren't taking notes, you could still pause this video to try and mentally recite the topics you remember. When you're finished, unpause the video and we'll quickly go over the important topics covered. Make sure to pay attention to any that you missed. You can go ahead and pause now. Now let's get to the review. This slide focuses mainly on the internal anatomy of the leaf. We talked about photosynthesis. Make sure you know what is needed for photosynthesis to take place and what it produces. We talked about the three basic parts of the leaf cross-section, the mesophyll, vascular bundles, and the epidermis. The mesophyll is divided into the palisade mesophyll, which is responsible for the majority of the photosynthesis, and the spongy mesophyll, which helps with gas exchange between the palisade mesophyll and the stomata. The vascular bundles were made of xylem, which transports water into the leaf for photosynthesis. 
Phloem, which transports sugars made from photosynthesis out of the leaf to the rest of the tree, and the bundle sheath, which protects the xylem and phloem. The epidermis protects the leaf and is covered in stomata, which exchange gases like carbon dioxide, oxygen, as well as water vapor through the process of transpiration. The cells in the epidermis also secrete the waxy cuticle, which prevents water escaping through anywhere except the stomata. This slide mainly focuses on the external anatomy of the leaf. We talked about the various parts of the leaf, including the apex, margin, veins, midrib, and base, which are part of the leaf blade, and the petiole and stipule. We talked about the types of venation a leaf can have, parallel and monocots, and reticulate and dicots. We talked about indeterminate and determinate growth, and how this makes laminar size a helpful characteristic when identifying trees. We talked about the difference between simple and compound leaves, and the various properties and types of compound leaves. We talked about phyllotaxy, or the arrangement of leaves on a stem, and how it corresponds to the number of leaves per node. And last but not least, we talked about conifer leaves and how to make identifying them a little less daunting. That's all. Thank you for watching.